Beasts, Oceana. Again, Paul, detail from you, please. Yes, look, Oceana is a proper fishing group, and that at least is the entire business. It was incorporated in 1918, so been around a while, listed in the JSE and also in Namibia, interestingly. Its principal shareholders are Tiger Brands. So Tiger Brands, this is their vehicle in the industry. Brimstone, which we'll also talk about after the break, is an empowerment group which owns a 20% stake, and then there's the Cooler Trust. Brands here, we're talking Lucky Star and Glenreich. You've no doubt seen those in the supermarket, distributed here as well as internationally. It's got a market cap of 5.5 billion rand, price to earnings ratio 12.7. Back to you. Now, if you look at the statements that Paul made earlier about the fishing industry possibly being one in decline, now we've got a pure fishing play. How does that stand with you? Well, look, I mean, if, if it really was a struggling industry, you'd see perhaps a lot of debt on the on the books and a uh, struggling company, but this is an ungeared balance sheet. It's probably a balance sheet that many uh, companies would love to have. Um, very cash flush, and as a result of that, it passes that cash to, to shareholders. So you're sitting on a 5% dividend yield. You're about just over 3.2 um, to NAV. So um, fantastic valuations, and, and so it doesn't look like an industry in decline. Why are we giving all the attention to the chickens? We should be <laughs> focusing on the fish, for goodness sake. And quite indus industry, in, interestingly, um, fish is quite an interesting source of protein for the African market. 2.5 million people in uh, the countries that they serve, um, they, what are they called, horse mackerel, um, are served per day by uh, Oceana, and about 2 million South Africans are eating pulchards per day. So it's quite quite interesting that it is an important sort of source of protein. I don't see, Paul, how you can be negative on this story. <laughs> I think you've got to switch your attention from those chickens to the fish out there. But look at this point I'm making. 20 years ago, you sent your trawler out, and as long as the people didn't get seasick, they came back with a full tank. You offloaded it on the wharf side, you chopped them up, you put them in the supermarket, everybody's good, you have the canning end as well. Chicken in the last 20 years has been massively increased its productivity just as a result of more technology in the broiler area, better chicks. The life cycle has been brought down. The scale at which they can be produced has increased. We know all about feed lots with regard to beef. So suspending for a moment what these things taste like, there's no question that the fish, unfortunately, don't respond to uh, agriculture particularly well. So you can't make fish farming activities except in certain limited areas. So you're insinuating that we need more technological developments in the fishing industry before you deem it worthwhile <laughs> But you can't. From, from you can't change the technology. They're out in the ocean. You know, all you've got is sonar to find the little buggers. So there's no way you can make the I'm process so particularly sure more effective. I'm not so sure I'm following your story. So the productivity... I, I don't think you're an expert fisherman. <laughs> maybe, maybe Craig. He at least lives in Cape Town. I think he probably has a better view of the fishing industry than you do. Craig, have there been technological advancements in the fishing industry? Please say yes. Well, look, I think, I think what he says is, is, is largely true. Just like there's been technological advances in terms of mining and, uh, and extracting min uh, minerals from the ground, so there has been in fishing. But um, the only thing you really can farm with which some of these companies are involved with is abalone. You haven't been successful with lobsters and, and fishes to, to fi fish. Listen to me, to a, <laughs> to a large degree. So, so that is true. But I think what, what what's important is um, it is a limited and controlled market. And South Africa's mar market is actually very well controlled. And I see that as more of a positive than a negative for these companies. Have you eaten abalone before, Mr. Turan? A long, long time ago. But I want to talk about two other negatives here. The first is there was a court decision a couple of months ago that ruled that the quotas for the small guys, you know, the little uh, fishermen living on the beach who would get the quotas because the government was trying to be helpful to the little fellow, they've ruled that those are not allowed to be transferred. Because a lot of time what was happening, people were getting these quotas and then basically just on selling them to the big companies. So that's going to be a setback because effectively that's taken the wind out of that. The second thing is, and I don't know whether you noticed in the Mail and Guardian 10 days ago, there was a report saying that Oceana had paid a 30 million rand fine because they were fessing up to the fact that there had been price fixing in the fish business. So the other parties haven't commented yet, but I fear that the Western Cape is about to be engulfed by another food-related competition scandal following hot on the heels of the bread scandal, and that is that all of these companies are potentially at a risk because of price collusion. 
Well, Craig, that could be a big concern. Price fixing in the fishing industry. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So that 34.7 million he's talking about is not, uh, appears to be fixed. It's that, that there's nothing further to come out. But the investigation of the Competition Commission could go further. And it's a very incestuous type of shareholding, which we'll talk about a little bit later on with Brimstone. So there may well be uh, some form of collusion that may come out. But um, uh, it, 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 it... You think it's ring-fenced at that number? You don't see this being a, a deeper, bigger issue that could well, pa perhaps break the company? Well, this specific investigation, I understood, took about three years. So that's been settled. But, um, but there could well be other issues. But um, it is a very uh, uh, um, uh, interesting situation because a lot of attentions come even on Sukhanjala's side in terms of who controls uh, the, 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 the trawlers and the quotas and then who's actually bringing it in and who's involved in the canneries. And there's a lot of cross-involvement. And so uh, to a large degree, it, 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 there's a natural tendency that, that price fixing could, could occur. Yeah. Paul, hot or not on Oceana? Look, the only thing for me which uh, is positive is that Tiger has a 37% stake in it. And as far as I can tell, Tiger isn't really all that interested here because they've allowed uh, the Brimstone people to take the controlling interest and to be uh, represented on the board in greater numbers and the chair and so on and so forth. So I think there's potential for some corporate action. And I do think it's a well run business and all of that stuff. I just think, as I say, that globally the fishing industry is not in a great state. I think the fish are running out. Our resource has been fairly well managed, but I just don't see the, the growth upside particularly in this one. So not hot for me, sorry. Craig, hot or not? Uh, these valuations are so sizzling hot. 